Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to start by joining colleagues from across the House in warmly welcoming my honourable friend, uh, the Minister, back to her place. It's a great pleasure uh, to see, us back here, see her back here today. Um, I rise in, in very strong support of this bill. I think it's a, a long overdue redress of our constitutional balance and the use of the royal prerogative. The bill reasserts that Parliament is sovereign in our democracy over what are fundamentally political decisions. Now, speaking to Clause 1, the Fixed-Term Parliaments Act, which this bill repeals, is a prime example, I believe, of how short-term measures necessary at the time can have very hazardous long-term implications for our constitution. Now, I do understand why the coalition government considered it necessary to bring in the Fixed-Term Parliament Act, and the right honourable gentleman, the member for Orkney and Shetland, set out those reasons in what I thought was a very thoughtful speech earlier on. There were both political and economic considerations at the time. The reverberations of the financial crisis were still being felt, and the economic mess that was left behind by the outgoing Labour government needed urgent and stable administration. But the election of 2010 did not deliver that, and a clear outcome hadn't been achieved, so there was a need to show that the government would provide stability for a full term. Now, whether the Fixed Term Parliament Act was required to achieve that, or a simple bill fixing the length of a single parliament is something that we could debate endlessly. However, we have to deal with what is, and the detrimental trade-offs have been shown to be patently obvious. The Joint Committee uh, of both Houses, established under Section 7 to review the Act, found it flawed in several respects, and there are still un unanswered conundrums in key areas which demonstrate why the Act should be repealed. For example, uh, who governs after the 14-day period following the successful passage of a no-confidence vote. Is the Prime Minister still in charge? Should he or she resign immediately? Who takes over and how? Uh, what if an agreement is to be reached on the 15th day? Secondly, how do other traditional confidence motions, such as the Budget and the Queen's Speech, tie into the Act when statutory provisions mean that the Government could refuse to put a specific motion before the House? Thirdly, and most crucially, the gridlock, uncertainty, and eventually the utter paralysis, which became the hallmarks of the bitter disputes of 2019, meant that the country was faced with the absurd situation in which the government could neither legislate nor go to the country. Now, this massively undermined the status of government and parliament in the eyes of the general public. And speaking as somebody who was a member of the general public and not a member of this House at the time, I can testify to that. Every single person I spoke to was tearing their hair out at what they saw as self-indulgent paralysis in this House. Now, in his opening speech, my right honourable friend, the Chancellor of the Duchess of Lancaster, outlined the important elements contained in clauses two and four of the bill, but I'd like to focus at the moment on clause three, which I believe is, is extraordinarily important because it safe, safeguards the due political process from interference. Events during the last Parliament showed that the judiciary can be used and abused by activists to wage political wars through the courts. One of the most dangerous aspects of the Miller and Cherry case was not only that a group of largely unelected elites sought to thwart the democratic will of the British people, and I hasten to add, of course, that the 2016 referendum result was finally vindicated when we eventually had an election in 2019, yeah. but that it drew the sovereign into a partisan dispute. It is paramount for our constitutional democracy that the sovereign must be and must be seen to be above party political battles. And this bill will help to, th help to prevent such a situation from ever arising again by making the revived prerogative powers non-justiciable. And I think that that is wholly welcome. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, it is for these reasons that I will be supporting the bill and I congratulate the government on delivering another of its manifesto commitments. Yeah. Yeah.